Glitter on the Air. Tonight, Orson Welles produces and directs the 19th broadcast in the Mercury Theater series of dramatized great narratives. There have been a number of famous authors represented in the broadcast, but none so young as Ellis St. Joseph, whose name many of us may be hearing for the first time tonight. The story is one which Mr. Welles has long considered, and he takes great pleasure in presenting A Passenger to Bali by Ellis St. Joseph, one of the great short novels of recent years. The young author was born in 1911 and gathered material for a passenger to Bali during a trip on a freighter in the Pacific. Though all the characters in his story are imaginary, the hurricane and certain other of the incidents actually took place. The freighter upon which he traveled was making its last voyage, and his story carries the weight of first-hand experience. The Mercury Theater on the Air presents A Passenger to Bali, starring Orson Welles as Dr. Albie Walsh. Captain English, perhaps the telling of this story will circle expel from my mind my last lingering glimpse of walk as I left him, a vision that appears more real in retrospect than it did at the time. It has grown real in the 14 years that have passed. It was what some men call chance and others destiny that link our lives on the dock at Shanghai and that alike disrupted them. 200 miles out at sea. I merely accepted him as a passenger on the steamship roundabout, a tramp steamer flying the British flag, carrying a crew of three white officers and 20 Kanaka boys, which I owned and put to trade in the Southern Pacific. Getting colder and thicker every minute. Sammy, that's what it is. They give you the creeps not to see five foot in front of you. Only white wherever you look. Dan Olsen. Fog is fog. Well, sometimes it is and sometimes it ain't. Superstitious, Mr. Randall? Now, look here, Mr. Stagg. You might be first mate and me only second mate. But we're both sailors. And I says it's a little queer. Fog like this ain't natural on the N.C. River this late in the year. The anchor ain't lifted yet. Captain broke. Bad omens, that's what. Saw a rat dive overboard this morning. You're joking. <laughs> we don't want to joke about a thing like that. That wreck's leaving a ship. No seafaring man is... Shanghai. What's the lead? What are they snooping around here for? Like blooming goats. Not to them, maybe. Yeah, they may be worse, eh? What I want to know is what brings them here. Here, Mr. Stegg, to the roundabout. I got a feeling about this here ship. Gentlemen. Oh, is that you, Mr. Angle? Yes, Captain English. They finished putting the coal on board. Will you pay them off as quickly as possible? Yes, I'll do that, Captain. Time's money. That's what I said. Dirty thought, sir. Notice how she's closing in, blowing right up the river in our faces with Lux Mr. Stack. Have you noticed anything, anything unusual tonight? Like what, sir? 
Well, for one thing, Shanghai Port Police. Oh, yes, I did, sir. Not more than a minute back, the launch went by. Anything wrong, Captain? Oh, I'm certain of it. You should have been out of the harbor and down the river two hours ago. Oh, well, what would be in the wind, Captain? Just, for instance, some sort of trouble on the waterfront, I suspect. I knew something was brewing when we had trouble getting our deck hands. Oh, is that all, sir? I was worried for a minute. <laughs> it's quite enough, Mr. Stagg. You can go right on being worried. No, I thought from the way them police looked, it might have something to do with us, sir. What? With the roundabout? Personal light. Well, it will if we don't clear this harbor. Ah, not a very pretty world where peaceful men have to go about carrying a gun. Never knew you to tell one of them before. Protection, huh? From what, sir? From the Yangtze Kiang here. And the river pirates that shark it. From my own Kanaka boys, if they get the right meaning of the wrong words. From such a night as this. Captain. Is that you, Captain? Yes, Mr. Randall. I paid that coding gang double quick, Captain. What I says is, save time, save money. Eh? Time's money. Right you are, Mr. Randall. We've got precious little of both of them. Well, let's be off. Give the orders, Mr. Stagg. Yes, sir. That was the first time I heard that man's voice calling my name. It's been ringing in my ears ever since. That was the first time I saw his enormous figure in its bell-shaped greatcoat. A figure that haunts me still. Haunts me. Mind you, I, I accept no more responsibility for his end. If, if it was an end, then I do for his emergence from the fog that night. Captain English? Yes? Who is it? By the honor of addressing Captain English of the roundabout. I am Captain English. Allow me to introduce myself, Captain English. I am the Reverend Dr. Rob Walks, a Dutch missionary. A missionary, Captain, bound for Bali, there to distribute Bibles and spread the word of the Lord. Oh, well, what can I do for you? Your hand, sir. The Lord has brought us together tonight, Captain. What the Lord has put together, let no man put asunder. <laughs> Isn't that your marriage sermon, Dr. Walks? Well, Captain, uh, our first meeting is a marriage. Or a parting. Uh, Captain. So, you're looking at this thing men call my face. Have you seen it before? No. Good, so much the better. Then we can start from scratch. Captain! Captain! Ready to rise? I'll be with you in a moment, Mr. Stack. Excuse me, you think we're ready to sail, you see? I'm not giving to wasting words in mundane affairs, Captain English. Not I. I saved my breath. You see how brief, how very brief I can be. Captain English, I am told that your boat puts in at Gulalong, the port of Bali. Is that correct? Quite. In that case, here you will find a Dutch passport, several papers for identification, mostly a clerical, and about 400 in American dollars. Be good enough to examine them. If the papers, the money, and myself meet with your approval, I shall sail with you tonight. Oh, well, your passport seems in order. The photograph is... is you? Yes. My shadow and the sun. Yet a man must hold his shadow or lose the earth that falls on. Eh, uh, Captain? The visa seems proper. These letters? Uh, testimonials of faith, sir. And the money? Testimonials of faith of another kind. Well, I'm afraid it's unfeasible, Dr. Walks. The roundabout is the trading scene. Name your price. Well, I admit you tempt me. His funds are a bit low right now. Now's the time, then. Decide, sir. You own the ship as well as commander. Yes, yes, I, I know. Then hoist your British flag, Captain, and be off with your Dutch passengers. Wait a minute. You say you're a Dutchman. Yet you don't have much of an accent. Captain English, the... 
Lord speaks in many tongues. It's odd that you should have waited until the last moment, Dr. Walk. His work knows no other time than the present. That's very irregular, you understand. Accepting at the last moment without proper investigation, a stranger who... A stranger? A minister of the Lord. Well, Captain? There's a police launch again. The third time tonight. Well, Captain? Very well. I'll take you. The uh, meeting, sir, is a marriage. <laughs> Ten minutes later, with Dr. Walks and his two large packing cases on board, we set sail from Shanghai. The following days faded into each other and blurred into weeks. First it was cold, then it was hot. Nothing disturbed the ordered routine except the presence of Dr. Walks. He threw a palpable shadow over the whole ship. Something you couldn't put your finger on. A sort of restlessness. Unspoken dissension among the crew. Even the officers. I pretended not to notice. And then one day it was useless to pretend any longer. Mr. Wrangler and I were on our way down to the mess room for lunch. From inside, we heard the voice of our Chinese cook. All right, Chinaman, now what more did he say? Uh, just what he say. He got fellow love God hate devil. What else did he say? Come on, spit it out or I'll break your wrist. What's this, Mr. Stagg? Ask him, sir. Chu? No, no, me no, no, Captain. Hey, ghost, please, Captain. I think I'd rather hear it from you, Mr. Stagg. Chu, you may go. Uh, thanks very much, Captain. Chu's been breaking place, sir. Gave me some lip. Guilty of insubordination. You saw the way he backed out. Your word's enough, Mr. Stagg. Thank you, sir. So I hardly see the necessity for handling it, well, <laughs> handling him as you did over a broken place. Ah, oh, blast him. I... More than the place. Well, what was it? That's Dutchman, sir. He's up to something. He's been talking to the crew. We'll, we'll not discuss the matter any further, Mr. Stagg. Gentlemen, shall we sit down? Dr. Walker is late for lunch, as usual. Uh, you may get for it, he will, when he sees the grub in front of him. Ain't natural for a man of the cloth to eat so much. And what I say is, how can any man be godly on a full stomach? <laughs> much easier, I should say, than on an empty one. What use does he put his belly to, I wants to know. Don't bend it to no work. Shoves it into the prow of the boat and stands there all day like a bleeding figurehead. What for? Well, what's a figurehead for? But is it natural, sir, always to have him ahead of us wherever we goes? It gives you the feeling that he's taking the boat where he wants. Uh, he's too big for his clothes, if you ask me. I don't think he's even a reverend. And I don't care if he is or not. He makes my gorge rise. Just the sight of him and that smile of his. Yeah, there is something queer about him, all right. You feel it yourself, Captain. Gentlemen, I'd, I'd rather not discuss Dr. Walks. Captain... You can use words better than I can, but I'm right and you know it. It was a bad night when you picked him off the wharf without knowing no more of him than you could see in the fog. Mr. Stagg, are you questioning the behavior of a superior officer? I'm sorry, sir. It's simply that I... Good day, gentlemen. Another day, another lunch. Yes, a good lunch, too, I see. Good day, Dr. Walks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stagg and Mr. Wrangle, I see, prefer a silent grace. Make it me to lie down in the green pastures. He prepared the table for me in the presence of my enemies. Amen. Uh, gentlemen, I have an excellent appetite today. I congratulate you, Dr. Walk. You've made a conquest of our cook. The quickest way to a ship's heart is through its belly, sir. Well, why not go straight to the heart? A uh, practicing missionary, Captain English, cannot afford an impractical idealism. Opportunism... Strategy, even lip service, sir. Uh, oh, do you really believe that the end justifies the means? The essential means is strength. The essential end is success. Oh, you believe even in violence, then, Dr. Walks, to attain your end? Even without an end, Captain English. Force. 
Sports, sir. Grab what you can in your fists and throw the scraps to the weak. The law of nature, sir. Time to kill, time to heal. Time to break down and a time to build up. Look here, I don't know where you get that kind of talk from. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 3. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. You ain't got no right to talk like that. Done only, that's right. What a good mind to report you to your bishop. Gentlemen, read man's past in water. Gentlemen, read man's past in water. Read its future and sand. Today is the time to tear down. Tomorrow, time enough to build. Mr. Stagg, did you hear that? I won't sit at the same table with a... With a what, Mr. Stagg? I don't know what. I have no name for the likes of you. Well, Stagg has had his fill. <laughs> uh, how about you, Mr. Wrangle? Is that the kind of thing you preach to the natives? I'm sorry for him, I am. Excuse me, Captain. <laughs> well, we're alone now, Captain. Are you with me, sir? No, Mr. Walker. You are with me on my ship, which you seem to have forgotten. <laughs> the days to Bali. We lay over at the Philippines, and then we stopped at Surabaya. Meanwhile, our passenger consorted with the crew, a companionship I didn't discourage, for it relieved us of his presence. Moreover, there was an epidemic of surreptitious drinking upon this particular trip, difficult to cope with. It seemed to have some connection with him, although what I couldn't tell. He got on altogether too well with the native crew. Night after night, his loud laughter mingled with theirs and carried up to us in the wheelhouse. And then, the evening before we reached Bali... Listen. Yeah, listen. You could hear it with six foot of dirt in your ears. Try to sleep through that. Look at them down there. Punching around that lantern like it was a bonfire. And him in the middle of leading him like he was queen of the maid. Ah, oh, shut that door. Captain, are you going to stand for it? What can I do, Mr. Stagg? Put him in chains. Well, we'll be rid of him tomorrow in Bali. What about that native crew down there? Ain't they going to be on board after tomorrow? I'll take my chances with them when Dr. Walks is ashore. Well, we know you're not scared, sir. But... It doesn't matter whether you think I'm a coward, Mr. Stagg. Oh, I didn't mean that, Yeah, you know, Captain... It's going to be a sad blow to lose our passenger. Come to love him, we have. Haven't we, Mr. Stagg? Yes, sir. Bali's in luck to get a man like him. Holy and wholesome he is. It ain't every day we have a passenger like Mr. Walks. Say, what's that? Someone coming up from below. Captain English. English. What do you want, Mr. Walks? This is the wheelhouse. The passengers are not admitted. Captain English! What is it? No, sir. I am come. I am come to you from the ends of the earth, from the brine of the sea, a gift that fortune has bestowed upon you. Captain English! Mr. Rangel, kindly help uh, Dr. Walks to his bunk. <laughs> My bunk. <laughs> bunk. What for, Captain English? Shall I close my eyes and count sheep? Man has to... has no time to sleep. He count them all. <laughs> Dr. Walks, you have a fever. Your heavy clothes in the teaser. Sleep 
was a rehearsal of death. I want to live. Yes, but Dr. Walk, Captain you bet. Captain English, I would like the inestimable privilege of your help in going ashore. Tomorrow, in Bali, the Balinese, very ungodly, very ignorant people, ignorant Captain English, they worship the, the Karuga bird, an evil spirit. Dr. Walk. I shall free them. Free them from the Karuga bird. I... Hey, the tag, take the wheel. Blanco, give me a hand with him. Come on. His heart's beating, sir. Why? He's drunk. Drunk, is he? Oh, blimey. Well, at last there's something has got the best of that blasted Dutchman. <laughs> next morning, we lay off the shallow water of Dula Long. As I leaned across the deck's railing, looking gratefully at the white coastline of the island that was to relieve my ship of its unwelcome passenger, waiting impatiently for the arrival of the government launch, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I glanced backward into the Dutchman's face. An impersonal smile buttered his lips. Captain English, sir, I beg a word with you. Surely, Mr. Walks, you're not so poor in words that you need to beg one. I would... Uh... Buy it, if I could, sir. Oh, no need. If it's farewell, you're welcome to it. Gladly. Captain English, I am a miserable and a repentant sinner. The devil has used me for his own ends. If you can find it in your heart to forgive and forget, Captain English, I am sure we can come to an equitable arrangement. Your conduct is no concern of mine, Dr. Walk. <laughs> Precisely. You weren't paid to watch me, but... If you're agreeable, I should now like to make my, uh... uh welfare your business. Here, here's... Two hundred dollars in the currency of God's own country. Oh. What's this for? I'm hiring one of your lifeboats for the brief period of a half hour to get ashore. Well, it seems you're not yourself yet, Dr. Walks. Perhaps I'd better hold your money until you're master of it. I knew I could rely on your discretion. Now for the lifeboats. Very well, sir. As soon as the port authorities have come on board. Oh, no, 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 no. Now. I'm afraid that's impossible. Good Lord, man, that's what I'm paying you for. If you think I want to wait on your deck until my papers are inspected, do I have to explain? I understand you well enough, sir. I prefer not to know the details. I'm as anxious as you to have you off my ship. But if you double the bribe, I wouldn't lord a line to save you. Must I swim for it? I wouldn't if I were you. That's the government launch now. See? Over there on the starboard side. Oh, order. Up order, order, and you make it? There's still time. Now listen, man. This is your last chance. Yours as well as mine. Listen to me. Get me off this boat. Or take the consequences. I swear it. You ransack the four corners of the globe. Looking for this minute. Don't let it slip through your fingers. Eternity in it. A moment later, the authorities came on board. Captain English. Ah, welcome, sir. Oh, are you the captain? I am. I am Van Matzis, chief inspector of the port of Bulalong. A pleasure, sir. We've anticipated your arrival with impatience. We are anxious to clear port as soon as we can. Ah, so I look over your papers. Bills of lading, cotton goods, manifest. <laughs> Thank you, Captain. Oh, what is this? The declaration. A passenger? You say here is a passenger? As you see. But uh, what is this passenger doing on your ship? Here is not room for passengers, no? A missionary. Will you examine his papers, please? A missionary? 
You are sure? Yes. So? Very peculiar. Oh, I see nothing peculiar about that. But, uh, Captain, there is not the possibility for a missionary here at Bali. What? what what's that? We are not uh, permitting a missionary here for many, many years. All the world knows this. Well, I didn't know it, sir. I wouldn't have carried him if I had. I can believe you, Captain. Sir. Yeah. Well, uh, perhaps now we could see this passenger? Of course. Mr. Stagg. Yes, sir. Ask Dr. Walks to step to the side of the deck. Yes, sir. He is called Walks, this man? Yes. Walks, eh? Dr. Walks. I'm here, Ben Matthews. Uh, glad to meet you, sir. Dr. Walks, eh? Yes, Dr. Walks. This morning I wake, the birds sing, the sun is shining. Why is no volcanic eruption warning me that you are coming, Dr. Walks? My good sir, I am the eruption. <laughs> one moment, one moment, I don't understand. You, you, see, you mean you know this man? Certainly, I am knowing this man, your missionary. I am knowing him very well. Oh, yes. oh, he is such a clever man. Yes. How is it possible you are coming as a clergyman here to Bali? It was so wrong. But what yeah, is My it? dear sir, this was the only suit that would fit me. I had no time for shopping. Uh, you're not making clothes big enough to fit you, eh? No. No, nor countries either. Here's my passport, sir. A passport? <laughs> this is a forgery. <laughs> a clever forgery. But a pity. You have such a great talent, Mr. Wong. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Such a good copy, this passport. It should be framed. Thank you, sir. If it's that good, I should like it returned for future use. Thank you. <laughs> such a talent. You could have been a Van Eyck, a Van Ostad, a Rembrandt, Van Rijn. If only you had been so lucky to be born a Dutchman. What's that? What? He, he's not Dutch? No. This gentleman is not a Dutchman. He is not a missionary. He is not even his own name. What, what is he? Here is an international figure, Captain. Everywhere he goes, he's making trouble. He's making trouble first in the West and now in the East. You have a... A famous man on your boat. Oh, please be clear, sir. What does he do? What has he done? All this, he is making trouble with the natives. Last year, 5,000 coolies were following him from the cotton mills in Wuzhou. Not uh, two hours from Shanghai. Uh, six. Uh, 6,000 coolies, sir. Yeah, <laughs> 6,000. I beg your pardon. And in Cebu, he was leading the Filipinos in a trouble but was nearly closing the port. It closed the port. It closed the port. He knows. <laughs> now they have cabled us from Shanghai. He is wanted there by the police, so now he is hoping he is landing here in Bali. But we are being too smart for him. But what's his name? What's his country? What am I to do with him? He has many names, but he has no country. Somebody is knowing, of course, but nobody is telling. <laughs> the Dutch East Indies are close to him. I do not know where it's not close to such a man. <laughs> I doubt you will lose him. <laughs> Ever. But to whom does he belong, Herman Matthews? I refuse to be burdened with him. You have no choice. What? Uh, Captain, I am sorry for you. Here he is on this ship. He belongs to you. <laughs> Would you turn me into a flying Dutchman, sir? A flying Dutchman, that's right. <laughs> that's what you are. You will sail from now until eternity. <laughs> yes. A flying Dutchman. <laughs> a flying Dutchman. <laughs> listening to a CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in The Passenger to Bali by Ellis St. Joseph. The play will continue in just a moment. 
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We continue now with The Passenger to Bali by Ellis St. Joseph, starring Orson Welles in the role of Raube Walk. <laughs> Bali, the first seven days were a week of doomsdays. The news of our flying Dutchman flew like a screaming gull before our mast. In Makassar, Benjamin, Rembang, Batavia, Koba, Pekan, Singapore, Bangkok, the answers were all the same. Oh, uh, Captain, you cannot land him here. We don't want him. We won't have him. We want none of him. We know him. He's a pest, a plague, this man. We don't want him here. This port is closed to Mr. Watt. Moreover, so long as he is on your ship, the port is closed to your ship. You can't land him here. You can't land him. You can't. Not here. 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 never attempted to escape, although heaven knows we gave him every opportunity. One day, we opened his two packing cases, which he had said were loaded with Bibles. One was filled with gin, the other with empty bottles. It is impossible to say when or how, but slowly, imperceptibly, our passenger came to take possession of the ship and all its crew. The native crew fell more and more deeply under his spell. I was their captain in name. He, in fact, also, inevitably, as he threw the officer's mind, he ousted all other thoughts until he possessed them by their very hatred of him. We felt the restrictions of our forced association far more than he. We were his prisoners, not he ours. And when, at Mr. Spagg's suggestion, a concerted plan was attempted to put walks into Coventry at mealtime, walks without opening his mouth, except to eat or closing it, except to smile silenced the entire company. He all but emptied our stores with his huge appetite. At last, sacrificing all hope of profit, all hope of everything but emptying our ship of that loathsome passenger, we set our course west under ballast to Shanghai. Shanghai, where he was wanted by the police. Where we took him on. There, he would finally put him off. Uh, I, I felt that the ship would rise five feet out of the water once relieved of the Dutchman's weight. We steamed up the Yangtze River early one morning and anchored off Shanghai. The port officials informed us that the British consul was to favor us with a personal visit. It was noon before he came aboard. Captain, Captain English, he's here. Mr. Chisholm, the consul. Come in aboard, sir. With his portfolio under his arm like he was going to Geneva. And a monocle in his eye like the rising sun. But never sets on the British Empire. Ah, Mr. Chisholm... I'm Captain English. Oh, yes, sir, yes. It's so nice to meet you. If you'll excuse us, Mr. Wrangler, I'd like yes, to... Yes, sir. I'm very grateful to you, sir, to take so much trouble to come down personally to... Well, not at all, my dear man. Uh, the Chinese port authorities informed me of your predicament and asked me to handle it in my own manner. Oh, so much the better for all of us. According to their specific instructions. Why, I, I don't understand. Yes, my dear fellow, don't try. It's diplomacy. Only the stupid try to understand diplomacy. And they spoil the game for the rest of us. Uh, it's like playing blind man's buff with a really blind man, and that makes it too macabre. Uh, I say, uh, won't you ask me to sit down? Oh, well, please, please. Thank you. I say, there's a cold draft on my back. Would you mind closing the door? Mm. A draft? What is it? In this heat? A diplomacy, dear boy. A diplomatic way of suggesting we may be overheard. Oh, uh, and now, Mr. Chisholm... Oh, yes, yes, yes. Where were we? Well, we hadn't begun. Uh, to be sure, your flying Dutchman. Yes, I'm awaiting your verdict. Incredible man. Incredible situation. Unendurable, sir. Well, of course, you can't land him here. Shanghai doesn't want him. You'd uh, better take him somewhere else. What? What did you say? Your passenger, oh, what's his name? Uh, Mr. Walk. Uh, the man's a bounder, you know. Shanghai has its quota of bounders. But, but I, I understood... 
Shanghai wants him. The police are looking for him. They were. They aren't now. But how can that be? Inevitable, my dear fellow. It's the philosophy of the flea. If you have them, you hunt them. If you don't, you don't go looking for them. Did did the Chinese tell you to say that? The thought is theirs. The phrase is mine. Good heavens, but uh, how can they refuse him if he's broken their laws? Mr. Walks will certainly be arrested if he sets foot on land, but he will not be given the opportunity. This saves the Chinese government a complicated legal procedure which might prove embarrassing. And what of my embarrassment? And likewise, dispenses with the trouble and expense of providing for him. And what of my trouble? What of my expense? Really, my dear man, my heart bleeds for you, of course. It's a, that is humorous aspect. What is what, the, what, what did you say? If one suspends one's emotions and thinks. Humor, Mr. Chisholm? All very well for you. But what of me? I'm the butt of the joke. Really, my friend. Our man is on my boat and I can't get rid of him. No port will accept him. Worse than that, no port will receive us while he's on board. They've turned him into a flying Dutchman, and they've turned us into a phantom ship. My crew is not allowed to land, not even to desert. Do you realize what that is? A sentence of death. Wholesale slaughter. Oh, what have I done to deserve this? You've accepted him. Well, is there nothing to be done with him? Absolutely nothing. I'm afraid that your famous passenger is a man without a country. I am helpless in the face of that. Then what, what can you do for me, Mr. Chisholm? Am I expected to sail him around the world all the rest of my days? It looks that way, doesn't it? I'll scuttle the ship first. Not a bad idea. Oh, I'd, I'd hope that at least you, Mr. Chisholm, at least if you... I might suggest... Yes, that... yes. Mr. Walks is a child of nature. He relies upon force. You might meet force with force. Force? Remember this, my dear captain... The man you have on your ship carries no passport, is claimed by no country. Legally, he doesn't exist. As such, no flag protects him. He has no rights. And uh, if he were suddenly to uh, disappear, no questions would be asked. Uh, do you follow me? Yes. If I were uh, in your shoes, Captain, I'd uh, go for a walk with him on some dark night. Around the deck and uh, talk. You know, talk. Keep on talking to him until you come to the railing's end. And then... But... but that's murder. I fail to see how you can murder the man who doesn't exist. He does exist. It's what none of you seem to realize. He's a man, the same as you and I. He might commit suicide, you know. <laughs> well, I must leave now. I shall anticipate a bit and report that your passenger does not exist. I found no one on the boat that remotely resembles Mr. Walk. Sir! My ghost, gentlemen! He'd moved in so quickly that we'd not noticed his coming. Is this the English consul? The august representative of Great Britain? Uh, as I was saying, Captain, I should report that there is no such person as Mr. Walk. Uh, your passenger doesn't exist. Uh, nevertheless, I must take the proper precautions. I shall report that I found plague on board. Um, cholera, I think. Would you turn me into a disease? <laughs> no, a bubonic would be better. Yeah. Your, ship, your ship will be placed in quarantine. Needless to say, no one will be allowed on nor off, and uh, you will depart as soon as possible. Shall I swing a bell and shout, unclean, unclean? China can control bubonic. But she has no antidote for Mr. Walk. You are quite clear, Mr. Chisholm. Good day, my dear Captain. Good no, day, sir. I don't, Mr. Chisholm. I'm big enough to fill this doorway. I wouldn't try to pass if I were you. I'm a catching disease. I warn you. The captain and the crew have caught me, and I'm fatal to them. Try to pass me, and you'll catch it. So, you see, Mr. Chisholm, when I'm in your way, you've got to take notice of me. Why haven't I do it just after all? That's all, sir. You may leave with my permission. Well, Captain English, we are... As we were. No, Dr. Walsh. No, how so? Shanghai, your last chance to lose me. It's out. I'm yours. No. No? I must take Mr. Chisholm's advice. 
she suggested one more porch, still another. Is there such a place, such a land on earth? Have no doubt. They will accept you there. Will they? I should hardly have thought it possible. Even if I were to die, I doubt if you would lose me. You'd probably carry me back and forth between heaven and hell. <laughs> Mr. Walks was still on board when the roundabout weighed anchor and passed with the river out to sea. At night, the ship began to roll. The barometer fell. We headed the ship into the wind. I was unable to stay in the wheelhouse alone with my thoughts. Mr. Chisholm's whisper was blowing like a foghorn through my brain, urging me. I fled to the deck and the welcome company of my two mates. Mr. Rangel. Yes, yes. Report to the wheelhouse. Take the wheel yourself, and don't let it out of your hands. Very good, sir. Uh, Mr. Rangel. Yes, sir. If the wheel starts to kick up, call me. We may need to lack that. Yes, sir. Look, bad, sir. Well, we're in typhoon waters, Mr. Stagg. Look, bad, sir. Well, we're in typhoon waters, Mr. Stagg. But it's past the season, ain't it? A uh, shark's tail is more dangerous than its tooth. I don't like the look of that hammered water or those oily clouds on the horizon. Captain, I've been thinking a good deal these last two days about... Well, you know this situation of ours, yes. about walks. Now, I got an idea. What is it? You know, I don't know how to say it. Well, why not? What's to keep us from giving them a light boat and some food and setting them adrift? Half to death. But we wouldn't be there to see it, would we? Oh, no, no, that's impossible. It's inhuman. Well, I suppose you'd sooner see him drowned. Kinder, eh? Drowned? Why not, sir? It's going to be a dark night, isn't it? A man fell overboard tonight. Who told you to say that? Why, nobody, sir. Man, sir, it's it's beyond me. Listen, sir. We can't carry him from now until the day of judgment. If he were on land, the law would do it for us. You're the law, see. I, I refuse to discuss. Think of him, sir. You think it'll be pleasant for him to spend the rest of his life at sea? Never to put foot on land? Have you thought of that? I thought of it. I, I, I don't want to see. He's a Jonah, I tell you. He should be thrown to the whales. It isn't safe to have him on board. Fire the boilers and jump steam. Keep her headed into the wind. Yes, sir. Tighten down the hatches. Call all men on deck and down in the engine room. Secure everything. I'll see to the wheel. Yes. Dirty weather, eh, Captain? What? Why are you surprised? Were you thinking of me? Or were you conspiring with the wind and the waves? What do you want? I told you before, you're not allowed in the wheelhouse. Never. Never. Speak with you. I have nothing to say to you. But I insist, shall we? Take a turn about the deck. You're out. Very well. I'll be brief. But the storm comes. Yeah, dark night, to say, but perhaps we won't notice it if we talk, you know. Talk. Keep on talking. Ah, you prefer to stop. No, no, let 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 let's be going. Railings in. Oh, but this is an excellent place. Chance has guided us. Pure accident. The railing thing. I must go onto the bridge, Dr. Walk. Tell me, sir. Why do you hate me? What? I... This is no time for equivocation. If you must spare me, spare me that. Give me the reason, one good reason, why you hate me. Uh, you tricked me into accepting you on this boat, knowing very well what would happen if you were caught. But your animosity began long before you knew me for the villain I am. You had a demoralizing influence on the whole crew. Your before that, that, sir, it began before that. Uh, your ideas. Captain English, think back. Certainly it began before I attempted to corrupt you with my ideas. It, it began? Yes? The night I picked you up off the wharf, I suffered a physical revulsion the moment I laid eyes on you. I found my reasons later. That night, Mr. Walk, I disliked you without cause. Thank you. You disliked me before you knew anything about me. And you must have disliked me for some reason. Some reason within yourself, Captain. Perhaps you do right to blame me for making you conscious of Mr. it. Mr. Walk, I must go to the bridge. Wait a minute. 
You owe me responsibility for the undesired linking of our lives. That's no responsibility. It's yours to blame, not I. You and the civilized world, your world. They bound me to you. Let me go. Let go my arm. But civilization is rotting, Captain, because its origin is fear. The vacuum that nature abhors. But the center of it is hurricane. Upon which the four winds of the earth are converging. Just, just me, I must get to the pit. Let me go with Listen you. Listen to me. Your society is tottering. For 2,000 years, the strong have been sacrificed for the weak. And with what result? To imprison the strong, the weak have imprisoned themselves. The wheel, Captain English, the wheel. That's why you abominate me, Captain, because I destroyed your illusion of freedom and betrayed you to yourself. I am the opposition. The wheel, Captain English. If our positions were reversed, Captain, do you think I'd hesitate for a minute? I'd move quietly. I'd take a sudden step forward. I'd find heaven, I will. You are not strong enough. This ship is mine now. Mine. I, I'll never leave it. Get up! Back your life. You would have died with your conscience. You would never survive me. The wheel, Captain. The wheel. Rope, the wheel loose. The wheel, you get size. The wheel. Ah! He managed, I don't know how, to gain the wheelhouse. A flash of lightning showed the ocean pouring in through the broken portals. Another flash, and we saw the whirring wheel, a huge wooden wheel in blurred outline, spinning, spinning. The rider lay in the corner, crumpled in a natural angle as the wheel had thrown him. He was dead. His body more bore mute witness to the wheel's horrible force. It would chop our hands off if we touched it. It was overwhelming, inexorable. It had a diabolical mind of its own, intent upon our destruction. And we danced about it like idiots. The ship was shrieking in a death agony. Her life was a matter of moments. With an uncontrollable rudder, she would drive herself down into the deep. A great wave struck the walls and broke in the door and descended upon us. As the ship raised her shoulders above the sea and the water washed out through the whirring wheel, we saw looming in the doorway of the wheelhouse an immense figure with the salt water running, running down him, dripping from his face and fingers. Mr. Walk might have risen from the sea itself. Out of the way! Mr. Walk, you can't stop that wheel! Can I? Can you, man? I'll kill you! I'm not afraid of it! I'll stop it if I have to smash it! Ah! Walk! Walk! He's got it! He's got the wheel on his back! I have. I've got the ocean. The whole ocean on my back! Can you hold it? Grab the wheel. Help him. Here. Let me get at it, too. Rope. There's rope coming. Do you hear? Yes. My collar. Open my collar. That's better. We can hold it. Kill the rope. I can hold it. Gentlemen. I doubt if it will be necessary. What's that? What's that you say? We're... We're holding nothing. The ship's rudder just snapped. For as much as it has pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our dear brother, Angus Randall, here departed, we therefore commit his body to the deep to be turned into corruption, looking for the resurrection of the body when the sea shall give up her dead and the life of the world to come to our Lord Jesus Christ, who at his coming shall change our vile body 
that it may be like his glorious body, according to the mighty working whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. Amen. Next morning, we took toll of the havoc through heaving silvery water and swirling fog the roundabout drifted aimlessly. Lifting 30 degrees to starboard, the ship was a corpse, floating, face upward, wrecked and mangled beyond all recognition. All but one lifeboat was stove in or gone. Four Kanaka boys had been washed overboard. Others had broken limbs. None of us was without a bruise of one kind or another. I took our bearings. We were 200 miles off the coast of China. We had no wireless. And the roundabout, past control or repair, might sink before she was sighted by another vessel. After a brief consultation with Mr. Stagg, I decided to abandon ship. And your mind is made up, Captain? Yes, Mr. Stagg. Are all men on deck? Yes, sir. And then, then who has been ringing the ship's bell? A boat! No, sir. A boat bell. On the ghost ship. Shut up, Walk. Rope is broken, Captain. Bell's ringing by herself. The swaying that does it. This is the flying Dutchman, demon vessel. We drift rudderless in the fog in all directions and to no port. Let the Spectre Bell boom its warning to all ships. Beware! He's done for. Been at it ever since Bring last night. My... Let Mr. Walsh talk. Let the bell toll. There's no time for either of them. Men, I'll... we're abandoning ship. Get what belongings you have, nothing heavy. We're taking to the one lifeboat left. Two, go to my cabin. You'll find the log there, my sextant. Bring them here. Captain, lifeboat leaks pretty badly. You'll do with bailing. Uh, you'll have to do. Be sure there's something to bail out on board. Yes, sir. I'll get it myself. Horse, Captain, right around the deck and give your orders on horseback. What's that? What are you talking about? The roundabout is no more. This is manifold, the vast boat that is the whole world. The mountains are a mass. The nails of her hull are a pivot to the moon. Her cables are the circumference of St. Peter's Dome. And extend around the globe. The ship is sinking, Mr. Walks. I've more to do than listen to fairy tales. Fairy tales is more truth than the use of force. Two, go get provisions and water ready. I tell you, this is manifold, Captain Manifold. Look about you. A lower mass. Are so high that a boy becomes a gray headed man before he reaches the buttock shroud. It takes a hundred years to tack. One of her sailors dies, she buries civilization. I've no time for you, Mr. Walk. Captain. Yes, two. Log, two sextiles here. I don't need both of these. Just put the log and one of them in the boat. Yeah, I'll take the other. Yes. A long way to row, Captain. Me and so. Pick up a doomsday passenger. Row on, sir. Row on. Captain, Captain, thou art mine, Captain, Captain, I am thine, thou mine, I thine, so long as the sea be bright. Come on, man! Oh, Hurry up! Get sir. your things in the boat! See that they don't overload, Mr. Sam. Yes, sir. See, they leave room for me. I'm a man that likes to stretch his legs. Are you so sure of yourself? As sure as I am of you, Captain, I can say anything, do anything. And it wouldn't make any difference. I suppose you can. I rely upon your charity, pity, mercy, your holy virtues that are oil for the faulty machineries of justice. Then it would be just to leave you behind. You won't. You'll take me with me. You don't dare leave me behind. How well you know me, Mr. Walk. I suppose you even rely upon my gratitude. Gratitude for what? You saved the ship last night. Gratitude, I saved you last night as a soldier infested by lice might crouch beneath cannon fire and thus rescue himself and them from a common death. I gave you no thought. I see. Captain, better make it fast, sir. I'll she below, Stag. Water up the boiler, sir. All right, Stag, we're ready. Give the order to abandon ship. Right. Abandon ship! Uh, All right, take it easy there. Don't crowd. Careful, men. Watch it. One at a time. Captain, this time I obey your order gladly. It wasn't meant for you, Mr. Walks. You are not going. What's that? You always wanted my ship. I'm giving her to you. She's yours. I'm not going! Now you're the captain. I needn't remind you of a captain's duty to stay with his ship you when... leave me on the roundabout. He may float for a week or an hour. You'll be safe for a while, and there'll be food enough even for you. 
I wish you a pleasant journey. Wherever you're going. I'll see you rock first. The one consideration that might have made me take you was my gratitude for what you did last night. But your explanation has made things clear. Ready, Mr. Sag? Yes, sir. Into the lifeboat, man. Don't let me know him, sir. Well? Captain, I have no excuse. I'm the lowest of the low. My home is deeper than the grave, deeper than the sea. You're right to desert me. It's only justice. Then there's nothing more to say. Now stay. The ship won't sink while a dying man repents. I am evil. Vile, I deserve to drown, and yet... Have you no pity, Captain? No charity? No mercy? Oil, you call this? Oh, I was drunk. You still are. I had a mother. I don't believe it. I don't ask to be excused, only to be forgiven. I forgive you, Mr. Walks, and forget you. Into the boat, men! Take your time now. Take your time now. Goodbye, Mr. Walks. Not so soon! Don't forget I'm your shatter, your doppelganger, your doomsday passenger. Mr. Walks, I warn you. The end of your world, Captain, the beginning of mine. You stay on the roundabout. I'll take the life Look out, Captain. Mr. Walks, stand back. Your voice isn't loud enough for me to hear. Stay where you are. Now, if I shout through the muzzle of this gun, you may hear the whisper. Hear you very well now. The pity had to end this way. I would move heaven and earth. Heaven and earth will stay where they are, sir. And so will I. Ready to lower the boat, sir. I'm coming, Mr. Stagg. My sexton, Mr. Walk. You'll need it. Not I. I'll shoot the sun and stars with more than a sextant before I die. Get along, sir, and whistle for the wind. We'll be meeting soon again. Lower away. Lower away. <laughs> off with no other sound than the movement of our oars. Walks followed us around the deck and finally lifted his hand and waved. We moved apart as the loom of the great hull grew shadowy, only a little heavier and darker than the enveloping whiteness. His colossal figure, like a ghostly apparition, appeared to dwarf the vessel. The roundabout rose gradually out of the black and silver water, and he, too, in midair, as though awaiting a message. Then the hulk dilated in the fog and faded on the horizon like sea mist in the morning sun. We could see nothing. Our own strained faces dimly in the milky light. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations have presented the Mercury Theater on the air in its 19th broadcast of dramatized great narratives. The story was A Passenger to Bali by Ella St. Joseph. The adaptation for radio was made by the author himself, and Orson Welles directed the entire production. In the cast tonight were Captain English, played by George Kaluris, Mr. Stagg, Frank Reddick, Mr. Wrangell, Eustace Wyatt, Ben Matis, Ray Collins, Mr. Chisholm, Alfred Shirley, and Mr. Walks, Orson Welles. The orchestra was directed by Bernard Herman, and Davidson Taylor supervised the production for CBS. Your announcer is Dan Seymour. Sunday night at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air will bring to life a masterpiece of humor. 
Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.